أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس أنتم الفقراء إلى الله والله هو الغني الحميد Today across the world we see that amongst the greatest social diseases is the problem of poverty. In the United States, for instance, we see that 700,000 people live in poverty. In the United Kingdom, 100,000 people live in poverty. And these nations are known as developed nations. We have not even taken a look or examined the statistics of countries like India or Pakistan or Iraq or Afghanistan, countries in the East that have been living um, centuries or at least decades in poverty. Today, when we take a look at this major problem within the world, political candidates, politicians, economists, they all come forth and they try to create a reformation methodology in terms of removing this problem of poverty from society. Yet we see that when we reflect upon the word poverty, the first thing that often comes to our mind is insufficient funds in one's bank account, or what we can coin as economic poverty. But when we take a look at the religion of Islam by virtue of the teachings of the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his Ahlul Bayt salam, we see that the term poverty is something far more vast and comprehensive. For instance, we see that poverty is not only limited to financial restraint but poverty, according to the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, is someone who doesn't have anyone to love him. Poverty is someone who is void of affection. Poverty is someone who does not have the ability or the potential to gain an education. Poverty is something that is far more wide and comprehensive than it is termed in the Western definition. We come forth and we see that an individual who fails to gain knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who fails to have the ability to be spiritual, is known as a poor person. When we take a look at the wide and vast teachings of the religion of Islam, and the teachings specifically of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, we see that they have reconstructed the definition of poverty, number one, and number two, offered us solutions in terms of how we can overcome these problems. But the first step in terms of recognizing this particular disease is to understand what exactly the term justice means. Because we see that justice itself is the foundation of the purity and progression of community. The hadith from Amir al Mu'minin, alayhi salatu wa salam, it states, Al Adlu Aqwa Asas. The greatest and the strongest foundation for community, for society, is justice. If we take a look at the world today, a survey of the elitists within countries, we see that oftentimes the top 1% are those individuals who are the recipients of the majority of the tax breaks and economic benefits within a particular nation. When rather we see that it should be a means and a process where those who are living a life of poverty, those who do not have enough food or drink in their day-to-day -day life, people who live in the intensity of the bitter cold without blankets and without, and, and without warm clothes, and those individuals who fail to get a cold cup of water in the intensity of the heat of some of the um, nations that we take a look at today where poverty is very prevalent, they unfortunately are not the recipients of those benefits that they should be receiving from the political elite, from the government, for instance. Thus again, we go back to understanding what exactly is justice. When we take a look at all of these problems in the world today, we see that it comes down to the fact of injustice and oppression taking place, which leads us to having so many economic hurdles and obstacles to overcome in our day-to-day -day life. We see that there are two different forms of justice. One form of justice is what is known as external justice. And the second form is what is known as internal justice. And what we are trying to state is that an individual or a community that has not won or has not created an environment 
for internal justice within his own heart, he's never going to be able to find justice, apparently. What do we mean? That today, when we have political leaders, when we have community leaders, when we have individuals who they themselves have not overcome the injustice that is taking place within their own heart, meaning that they're constantly transgressing the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly in sin, constantly performing acts of immorality and indecency, they can never be the flag bearers for justice in the world today. Only once we have individuals who have won the internal battle, meaning those individuals who perform actions solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have no longer wronged their own hearts and their own souls and their own selves as we recite in the Akum al-Ilahi, لَلَمْ نَفْسِي O Allah, I have wronged, I have oppressed my own self. Amir al-Mu'mineen is trying to demonstrate toward us that he, Ali ibn Abi Talib, at the greatest level of creation, he is an individual who submits the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you have a leader like Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, who demonstrates, of course, not the fact that he's a sinner, but in order to demonstrate how humble he is in front of Allah, then we see that his leadership and his reform is able to truly take place in terms of the injustices that take place in society. Which is why we take a look, for instance, at the government of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his 11 years in Medina. Or if we take a look, for instance, at the four years and the nine months of the governorship of Ali ibn Abi Talib in Kufa, we find that economic poverty is not, is not present. We find that everyone, they come forth and they live their life in equity and in justice and in, with opportunity. Many of you might be wondering, how about that story of that one Christian man that Amir al-Mu'mineen is walking in the streets of Kufa and as he's passing by, he states, Mahada, what is this? And directing toward this one Christian beggar on the streets of Kufa. Well, we take a look without getting into the details of that story. We take a look and we reflect and we see that for centuries there has been animosity toward Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam, where historians and theologians and philosophers and people of all different avenues, they've all attempted to reconstruct the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib and present flaws in order to demonstrate that he is not the man of merit and virtue that the followers of Ahlul Bayt often preach. We know this. Yet we find they can only find one anecdote where there was poverty under the government of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, and it, will, and it is that one story in which Amir al-Mu'mineen immediately reconciles within the community. How does Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam, remove economic poverty from community? And what are some lessons that we can learn today? Number one, as we mentioned, is that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he removes the problem of economic poverty and economic injustice in the community because he himself no longer performs the injustice of his own heart and of his own soul. Meaning that we as human beings need to make our very best effort to do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we devote ourselves to Allah, we see that God with his divine support will aid us in terms of removing any sort of social diseases that take place within community. This is step number one on a very basic understanding. Number two, we come forth and we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he frees up all of the natural resources within society and doesn't keep it in the hands of the government, but rather it is redistributed toward the public. What do we mean? That today we take a look at the social construct, political construct that we're living in the world today. And we see that wealth by means of oil and by means of gas and by means of coal and by means of water and all of the other natural resources that are present within the world today, they're all in the hands of the government. They're all in the hands of the authorities of the particular nation or region. <clears throat> Yet we find that under the Islamic government, the true Islamic government, the government of Rasulullah, the government of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the government of Ahlul Bayt salam, in terms of their construct, what do we see? We see that they free up all of these resources. They are not in the hands of the government to regulate, but they are for everyone. We take a look and we see that land is something that if it's open, if no one is living on a particular piece of land, if no individual, for instance, 
has settled on a particular piece of land, it's for anyone to go and attempt to build upon that. Yet we find that the government are though, is that body which helps to aid in this process of building of infrastructure and so on and so forth. When we take a look, for instance, at oil, which is an extremely, obviously, popular natural resource today and runs our economy, for lack of a better understanding, of the nuances of um, oil and the way that it impacts the economic world today, we come forth and we see that it is in the hands of particular groups um, and particular governmental organizations where they provide or where they tax um, immensely these important, significant natural resources which every human being needs. We find that under the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib, under the government <clears throat> of the Holy Prophet وسلم, we come forth and we see that every profit that that particular region gains from any of these natural resources, that wealth is to be redistributed back toward the community. Which is why, for instance, that we often hear about the stories of the followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen receiving wealth from the public treasury or the Baytul Mal. It's not just handouts that everyone receives, but there's a philosophy and there's a methodology behind that. And that is the fact that the natural resources within a particular community, they're in the hands of the government, but only to be redistributed for the success and for the progression of community. So we see that step number two, in terms of removing economic injustices and rectifying the problem of poverty today, is the fact that Ahlul Bayt salam, would stress the importance of freeing up natural resources by giving the land and by giving the resources within that land back toward the people. It is not supposed to be in the hands of the government, but every individual within community, within society, they should be able to reap the benefits of the God-given blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has offered toward us. And finally, number three, what Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he does in order to eradicate the problem of economic poverty within community is the fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam, would stress about the importance of being careful with the way that we managed our wealth within community and specifically within government. <clears throat> we find that one day Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he writes a letter to one of his governors and in this letter he writes this line, he states, O oh my companion, O oh my governor, when you're writing, uh, when you take those scrolls that they used to have in the olden days or they used to write on leaves or whatever it was, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, be precise with your pens. Meaning, he continues, He says, when you're writing, make sure you don't leave really massive lines in between your sentences. Meaning, save paper and write small, save ink. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, when you have a leader like this, we find that that influence, it trickles down to everyone. And we find that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, when he stresses a point like this, and he leads like this, we find that everyone who surrounds him, they have to follow suit. This is one example. And another example, and the famous story that many of us have heard, Talha and Zubair, they come to visit Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, and Ali ibn Abi Talib is doing his work sitting in the public treasury. At that moment, they come toward Amir al-Mu'mineen and they say, Oh Ali, we have some personal business to discuss with you. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he blows out that candle. He brings forth another candle and he lights it. When they ask him, they say, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are you doing? He said that that candle was, published, oh, what, what, what was purchased with the money from the public treasury. And this money, since you came to speak with me about personal business, I purchased this candle with my own money. Again, when you have leaders like this, when you have individuals who rule and lead like this, we find that absolutely there is, the, there is the potential to eradicate the problem of poverty today. Because when we take a look at the flip side, we see governmental organizations and politicians, and again, the political elite oftentimes in nations, what do they do? They hoard the money, the wealth, they increase their own salaries as they wish, they spend public money, when that money should be redistributed to people who don't have blankets in the midst of the intensity of the winter of the Western nations or the Eastern nations as we see. We come forth and we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen will was also extremely strict 
on terms of any of his representatives and in terms of any of those individuals who took forth political positions. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali والسلام, would remove people from positions immediately if he felt that they were performing any acts of injustice. When we take a look and when we examine this problem of poverty or of economic poverty across the world today, we take a look and we see that every individual has a responsibility to follow suit and reflect upon the teachings of Amir al-Mu'mineen of the religion of Islam in terms of this particular problem. That when today would we see that followers of the Ahlul Bayt in places like Iraq and in Pakistan and in Pakistan and in Afghanistan and in East Africa and really all across the world today, even in the Western nations, they are encountering this problem of economic poverty. We have to go ahead and reflect and see what responsibilities do we have toward these individuals. We have to take a look at our own accounts, see the way that we spend money. And it's not only about giving, but it's about raising awareness about people and about communities who are overcoming these particular problems. But very briefly, let me just mention this point. That economic poverty, as we mentioned, according to the theory of Ahlul Bayt salam, is only one form of poverty that we find within the Islamic construct. But we find that poverty is something far more comprehensive and far more vast, as we mentioned earlier. We see, for instance, that another, that another form of poverty that Ahlul Bayt والسلام, they reflect upon and they stress upon in reality is the problem of intellectual poverty. Individuals who fail to have knowledge, who fail to be able to read and write. The problem of illiteracy, for instance, in many countries, again, even amongst followers of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, is something that needs to impact us, is something that needs to pain us. We have to make our best efforts to not only encourage people in terms of basic necessities of reading and writing, but presenting people the teachings of Ahlul Bayt An individual who fails to have, you know, rawayat of Ahlul Bayt, individual who failed to have a copy of Nahj al-Balagha and, and failed to have the tawfiq to read the ahadith of Al-Kafi, they are poor. It becomes our responsibilities as ambassadors of Ahlul Bayt السلام, to remove this intellectual poverty that is also taking place where people are absent toward the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, that's a form of poverty itself. A third, a third form of poverty in addition to economic poverty and intellectual or educational poverty is spiritual poverty. Individuals who fail to know and to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are they missing? If they fail to gain in the ma'rafah of Ahlul Bayt, of Amir al-Mu'mineen what are they missing? They're missing everything. When we take a look and we see individuals walking on the street and sitting in their religious congregations or even in their Islamic centers, but they don't know about the greatness of the message of Imam al-Husayn we should feel bad for them. And we should make our very best effort to enrich them, to enrich them of the glory that we have within our school, the glory of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Thus we come and we have to take a look at the problem of poverty in a more comprehensive and in a more wider perspective. That number one, we have the problem of economic poverty like we mentioned, and we can take lessons from those teachings of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the teachings of the religion of Islam, in order to reconcile these problems and these diseases of economic poverty within our community and within our society by demanding that the political elite, for instance, that they make an effort in order to free up natural resources, for instance, or at the very least, we need to become amongst those communities who come toward their support. Number two, intellectual poverty, as we mentioned. The fact that people, they fail to have knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the Quran, about the Ahlul Bayt. And number three, spiritual poverty. And we need to become amongst those who hold the flag of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, and present it toward the world because their hearts are dark and their hearts are poor without the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, without the knowledge of Imam al Hussein والسلام, and the Imams that come from his progeny, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states in the verse that I began with, Ya ayyuhan nas, antum al fuqara ila Allah, wallahu huwa al ghani al hamid. O humanity, you are poor in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He is the all wealthy. That on the um, most important human individual level that every one of us are 
absent toward receiving the bounties and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus we always need to constantly be striving to attain closeness to Him that we become enriched by His mercy and by His bounty. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahumma ala Sayyidina wa Nabihina Muhammad wa ahla baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin.